Okay, we're recording now. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I, shit, I looked it up too, Crystal. So um, essentially, phenomenology is the science of phenomenon, right? Like how phenomenon gets mo uh, moved, how it gets actualized, how it gets performed, right? And so we're looking at whiteness as an unfinished history, right, or ongoing project. It's not something that's static. It's not something that has been um, articulated or defined, right? It's even, even in our now, it's hard to put an idea or pinpoint what whiteness is. And, and um, Ahmed is attentive to that. She's saying this idea is an ongoing project. And also, in the beginning of the article, right, that's some of the, the counter arguments to why people are against white studies, right? Like, it's going to actualized static, make this notion of whiteness static, right? And these are some of the people who are against this notion of white studies are articulating, but Ahmed says, nah, this is not, that's not the case, right? I'm studying this from the prism that understands whiteness is an evolving concept, right? Um, this idea of orientation, it's being a spatial reality, right? So it's an idea that deals with space. So this notion of starting at one point and going to another point deals with orientation, and she talks about that in the article, right? Um, she mentions the philosopher and the philosopher's children being over yonder, right? And yonder is somewhere that's in the distance, but it's only in the distance as predicated to where the philosopher is placed at, right? It's the philosopher's orientation. Um, Bodies are orientated when they are occupied in time and space. So again, we have the um, spatial temporal analysis, right? So your time, right? What, what decade, what year you were born in, where you came up, that orientates you, right? Your space, where you grew up, being in California, that orientates you a certain way. Um, and then she kind of goes into this um, Frantz Fanon excerpt from the book, Black Skin, White Mask. Um, from the chapter, The Fact of Blackness or the Lived Experiences of the Black Man, depending on what translation you have. Um, but he says, you know, beyond the, the, the epidermis, beyond the surface, right, there's the racial historical schema, right? And, and I'm defined by this racial historical schema by the other, right? The white man has pieced me together by a thousand stories, anecdotes, and details. Right. Uh, one second. Yeah. So this is um, this is her working through Fanon, right? So again, being attentive to the way that history and the way that um, history informs race and informs the way that people are perceived and looked at. Um, then she also talks about how whiteness as an orientation that places things within reach, right? This notion of access, right? Whiteness provides you certain access to certain things as an orientation. Um, and then this notion of institutional whiteness, how institutions begin to take on the characteristics of, of the epidermis of the skin type, right? And this goes in with this term, this notion of likeness, which ties into the notion of recruitment, right? Bodies that are recruitable. And she uses this analogy of the hey you, right? And the hey you only goes out to those who occupy a body that you can relate to or you see yourself working with. There's actually this term, damn, I forget the term. It's like, it was all over LinkedIn. It's all in conversations around hiring now. And it's like something to the effect of you hire people you see yourself having lunch with or something, some kind of terminology around that, right? So essentially it's speaking to what Sarah Ahmed is talking about when it's likeness, right? You're going to hire somebody, you're going to um, interact with somebody who you feel comfortable with, who you like, or who looks like you, right? So this is what she's kind of getting us to try to understand and problematize, right? Bodies that are recruitable, bodies that are, are in likeness to that orient under this idea or this umbrella of institutional whiteness. And then again, as it pertains to whiteness, placing things within reach, right? She says the white body is the body that will utter, I can. And then Fanon says the black body is the body that utters, I cannot, right? So again, as you think about things being placed into reach. And then she, she goes in towards the later end of the article 
and to me this is where it really stands out, is this notion of being stopped, right? And, and what bodies get stopped and what bodies are able to um, cover and cross certain borders. And she gives us the example of the airport, right? And although her passport says Britain, her last name says otherwise, right? And her last name is what causes her to be stopped, okay? And, and so when we think about that, and we think about this activity of being stopped, right? Think about how this pertains to a spatial reality, right? How it pertains to what bodies could go into what areas and what bodies could go into what neighborhoods, right? Think about how this, this plays out in the film that we watched. Um, and then also she had, which deals with the notion of the matter out of place, right? What bodies become out of place depending on the space that they're occupying or they're seeking to occupy. Right. Um, and then she also goes into this idea of the peas and the pie, right? Um, to where the similarities or the um, proximity is what shapes the peas, right? The environment is what shapes the peas to give a certain likeness, right? So for me, those are some of the things that really stood out as it pertains to the work of Sarah Ahmed. I mean, it's a lot more that we could kind of really go into. It's, it's a pretty broad and robust article, but those are some of the themes that really jumped out for me as a reader. Um, and then also thinking about um, how this ties into the video that we watch, really this idea of the spatial, right? Who can move into what space? And, and I think one of the things that the video does um, there's this larger conversation around who could go into what space as it pertains to gentrification, but then there's this inner community conversation as it pertains to who could go into what space by um, quote unquote, how black you are, right? Or, or do you fit these um, similar outcome of what blackness is? And you see this kind of play out with the character um, who's played by Jonathan Majors, um, the one who does the play, right? He doesn't fit this stereotypical depiction of what blackness is. So he's not able to travel within the space that's designated for him, right? So for me, those are some of the things that stand out. Those are some, some of the ways that I've tied the reading to the uh, video or the movie. But um, I'm gonna put myself on pause for that. I know Crystal has already volunteered to fishbowl. Um, I read off the names of those who fishbowled already. Um, if you have not fishbowled, you definitely want to take the time to do so. Um, so what I'll do is I'll open up, is anybody else want to volunteer to fishbowl? Let's go ahead and make that known. Alejandro wants to volunteer. I'll volunteer. And then Luis. Right. Let's try to get to, and Sam. So hold on, one second. I have Luis, I have Crystal, I have Emilio. Uh, I'd like to go to. Sam and I. Uh, So let me just make sure I got everybody, uh, Alejandro. So. Right. so who I have, um, Crystal Polik, Luis, um, Haro, Emilio, Sam, Isaac, and Alejandro. Did I miss anybody? Uh, can I still volunteer? Yeah, Alex. So, um, yeah, so we'll throw Tyler off in there also. And we'll close it out with that because that's a pretty robust fishbowl. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, we have eight people. So we'll, we'll close it out with Tyler. So again, we have Crystal, Luis, Emilio, Sam, Isaac, Alejandro, Alexis, Tyler. All right, so I'm gonna put myself on mute and I'll open up to you guys. Um, I'll start if no one else wants to start. Okay. Um, yeah, so first of all, it's kind of funny you were talking about the Malcolm X ballad in the bullet. Um, a few weeks ago, we actually went over that in history, and I had the same thought, like, oh, wow, this is so relevant today. So I just thought that was um, funny. Um, so yeah, I guess just kind of going through the reading, I'll do the same thing, just kind of highlight what kind of stood out to me and kind of what made me think of it. And I kind of connected some things to the movie as well. Um, so like on 152, yeah, when they're talking about whiteness as an orientation, you know, she talks about when Fanon talks about, you know, um, you know, and then the occasion arose when I had to meet the white man's eyes and unfamiliar weight burned me, you know, kind of talks about like, you know, 
being being noticed, you know, um, kind of like in the in the white spaces, kind of like what you were talking about. And then on the next next page, she kind of like summarizes it um, in the second paragraph. There, she goes. In other words, the racial and historical dimensions are beneath the surface of the body described by fe femininology. <laughs> I cannot say that word, uh, which becomes by virtue of its own orientation a way of thinking the body that has surface appeal. And it just kind of made me think of I've, I've um, I've heard, you know, several and, and seen several black people talk about how like, you know, you got you got to be like conscious of how you move your body, how you walk, how you talk, you know, like, you know, if you're wearing a hoodie, you better like make sure you don't have your hands in your pockets and stuff like that, you know, and it kind of made me think of that. And um, on the next page on 154 going down, she talks about, you know, kind of what I associate with kind of white privilege, you know, that um, you know, we don't really think about that. You know, me as, as a white woman, I don't really think about that, you know. Um, um, and she talks about, I thought the part where she talks about such an inheritance can be rethought in terms of orientations. We inherit the reachability of some objects, those that are given to us or at least made available to us within the what that is around. And it just kind of reminds me like how some people like they're trying to wrap their mind around this idea of like white privilege and you know like if they're maybe poor or struggling they're like well i haven't been privileged you know I, i'm poor and it's like no dude like that's not what we're talking about we're talking about like you can drive to work and drive past like say a cop car and not have to like worry like oh shit you know here we go i'm gonna get like pulled over like that's the kind of thing we're you know trying to get you to understand and i noticed kind of like the, that theme running through the uh the reading um like on uh, 156, kind of reiterating that, you know, the body's habitual, not only in the sense that it performs actions repeatedly, but in the sense that when it performs such actions, it does not command attention. So like if I, you know, am in a predominantly white neighborhood and I walk on a bus, like no one's going to bat an eye. But if someone who is of color, you know, all of a sudden, you know, and they talk, she talks about that, you know, that the heads turn, you know, like, you know, you get noticed. Um, and uh, yeah, on the next page on Win 57, she just kind of um, reiterates that whiteness is only visible for those who inhabit it or those who get so used to its inhabitants that they learn not to see, see it even when they are you know, not it. And it just kind of like those kind of points just sort of kind of made me kind of reflect on my own experience and like how like, yeah, like, you know, I, I don't have to worry so much about being harassed, again, because of what's been going on, I kind of was thinking of like police interactions, interactions with law enforcement. Um, I actually had a bunch of cops in front of my street. I, I think someone passed out on the street. And so like, yeah, so it just kind of was on the forefront of my mind. Um, and then, yeah, you were talking about like the peas in the pod analogy. I really like liked that too. Um, and it kind of made me think too, because like I live in a predominantly like um, like Mexican neighborhood, there's a lot of like um, concentrated like um, gr uh, Mexican population, and it's like just kind of neat because you can see like like there's like street vendors and food vendors that like serve really yummy food, by the way, like super yummy food and stuff like that. And it's just stuff that like you know if you go further on in more of the kind of like upper middle class areas, I guess, so, like the more nicest houses, like you don't you know you don't see that. It's more of like the manicured lawns and, and whatnot. Um, and then towards the bottom of 155, you know, um, you know, when she, um, when she was talking about in the case of race, we would say that bodies come to be seen as alike, as for instance, sharing whiteness as a characteristic, as an effect of such proximities where certain things are already in place. And it kind of reminds me in like the last black man in San Francisco, Jimmy, like when he's in the Fremont house, like he's no, no longer part of like, the neighborhood or like the people that he grew up with, you know, like um, Covey, I think was the name of the, the, the character that dies, you know, like, you know, when he's in the house with him, he's like, oh man, I'm really happy for you. That's cool. But like now when you're in your old neighborhood in front of the friends, now it's like, oh, you're no longer a, a part of us. Um, but uh, again, when he's in the neighborhood, he he's not welcome there either you know like he gets noticed like whenever him and montgomery are there um they always get noticed like you know even when he walks across the street you know he talks to that white neighbor and he's like what the fuck was that all about you know um so it kind of made me think of that especially when again she kind of was talking about like this conscious movement of your body and yeah like it just kind of made me think of that
Um, and then, yeah, when um, on 161, when she was talking about bodies being stopped, I kind of was thinking of like the stop and frisk, you know, for example, that like, I know that was a really relevant topic earlier this year um, enacted by Bloomberg. And it just kind of made me think, especially at the bottom when she talks about how does it feel to be stopped? You know, it's a, it's a social stress on the body. And I was like, yeah, like even me as like a white woman, if I get pulled over by like a cop or I get talked to by any authority of figure, like even if I got called to the principal's office in school, like I remember being super, super stressed out. And like, I, I, I can't even imagine what that would be like when thinking about like, you know, consciously like, you know, is this to do with my body? And like, you know what I mean? Um, so that was just kind of like, this kind of like made me sort of reflect on that. And then lastly, um, on 164, when she talks about the very fact of our arrival can be used as evidence that the whiteness of which we speak is no longer in place. It just kind of made me think of, because I know we were talking about it, like this token representation that we have, right? Like, like you see it with like, like Kamala Harris, oh, we have a black, you know, woman president. And it's like, well, you guys realize that she had policies that like, um, in a, uh, disproportionately affected black parents right like and you do realize she wanted to keep a black man in jail who was found innocent for dna for for misfiled paperwork so like and then you heard the same thing when obama was elected right oh like i was a waitress at the time and i remember people like white of course um like having conversations just like yeah i i don't want to hear any more bitching about like we're racist we got a black man as president now you know and it's like like no that's not that's not representation though you know um so yeah that was it that's all kind of like what i was thinking of when i read it yeah thank you chris that's really dope um one thing i, I do want to kind of highlight and articulate something that you mentioned earlier um just lack of control of one's body right and, and just to kind of think about how that played out in real time and how we got into the place now to where you the black body polices itself in a certain circumstances, right? And you think about respectability politics is all about policing the body. Um, but it, it makes me think about like black codes in Jim Crow era, right? Um, and the thing is something as simple as a, a, a laughing can. Has anybody heard of a laughing can? So a laughing can is if, if black people out in public and just to say somebody cracks a joke, there would be like trash cans set up along the street where you would literally have to put your head in and then you would laugh, get that out, compose yourself, and then you could go back into the world, right? So, so the idea was not to allow any white folks to see you out of the certain character that they want you to be in, right? So exhibiting emotions like laughter, they don't wanna see that, so put your head in this can and that way you can mitigate me having to see you perform a human act, right? So when you talk about lack of control of one's body is something as real as being able to laugh, right? Um, Fanon is really big on the gaze. Why is this the first time we're hearing about laughing cans? Uh, shit, I don't know. I guess it depends on what classes you took. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's all kind that of- It's so disturbing. Yeah, it's all kind of parts to this American history that, that we don't learn, you know? I mean, if you think about it, we don't go to so we don't go to history right like even in your k through 12 they don't call it history they call it social science right so we're being socialized to see history from a certain paradigm right so a lot of things like that get left off you know um the gaze right so fanon talks about what happens to his body once he encounters the white gaze right on the flip side they don't um Black people aren't allowed to have a gaze, right? You're not allowed to la look into some to a white man's eyes, right? This is something that was really drove home under the um, Jim Crow laws, under the plantation society and things of that nature. Um, but this plays out in real time in the real world in our now, right? So before um, I went to Cal State LA for my undergrad, I was at a school in Tennessee, in Jackson, Tennessee, historically black college called um, Lane College, right? And it's in Jackson. So it's in the middle of Nashville and Memphis, Tennessee, right? And 
very segregated town. Um, this is in the early 2000s, so this is not too long ago, but it's very segregated town, right? So to the point there's two Walmarts, Walmart on the white side of town, Walmart on the black side of town, right? Um, I mistakenly went to the wrong Walmart, and they had a, a way of letting me know that I went to the wrong Walmart. But this is not the story I want to tell. Um, one day, me and a homeboy of mine, actually two other homeboys of mine, were going to a gas station just to get, you know, some shit from the gas station. Um, how did it go? One person was ahead of me, and I was talking to the other person. The person ahead of me opens the door and like puts his head down, and is standing there. With, with his head down like that. I see him and I'm like, yo, what are you doing? This is weird, right? So, but I just keep walking. I'm thinking he's holding the door open for me, right? And when I walk in, I almost run into this old Southern good old boy, white boy, right? And he looked at me like I had committed, some, the white man looked at me like I committed some kind of offense, you know what I mean? But I'm from California, like all that shit, I don't, I don't know nothing about that, homie. Like you ain't, you know, you ain't no different than me. I'm about to look at you in the eye. I'm like, you know what I mean? Like, look, it, he opened the door, I'm about to go in here. Like, who is you, right? This is my mentality. But I'm, again, think about how she says, your space and your time orients your reality, right? So my spatial reality being from the West Coast is vastly different from the spatial reality to the people I'm with in the South, right? And when he was opening the door and he put his head down, that was to ensure the fact that he does not, his gaze does not meet the white gaze, right? So even in 2004, 2005, whenever that was, this idea of lack of control over your own body was still present in the person who I was rolling with, right? So we were in our 20s. So it's not like um, this is somebody who came up in the civil rights era. This is not like it's somebody who came up, you know, um, in, in the plantation system, right? This is somebody who was my age and he's already been oriented to know, one, if a white man's coming, I'm gonna open the door for him and let him go first, right? And then two, I'm not, I cannot look him in the eye, right? Not only did he drop his head, not only, excuse me, not only did he drop his eyes, he dropped his head and he dropped his shoulders, right? So he made himself small to make that individual feel comfortable, right? So when you talk about, and when Crystal talks about Ahmed's articulation for lack of bodily control, this plays out in a real material way, right? This is not so theoretical or hyperbole. This is really in the way that we have been oriented to present ourselves in certain regards. Um, so we'll open it back up for the, for the fishbowl. Uh, I'll do the next one. I'll try to follow that up. So I'll, I'll talk mostly about the film, but I'll try to tie it with the reading. So with the reading, there's like this, you know the idea of orientation and the spaces that our bodies inhabit and the story we tell the stories we tell we very much see that in jimmy fails like with uh you know he's very much tied to his uh you know the story of his own home he grew up the victorian home he grew up in like his, his grandpa his grandfather supposedly built it and he's he's very much boxed in with, in, with that identity and despite the fact that he's being pushed out through the process of uh gentrification in san francisco and like we see this and we see this 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 idea of being in like you know our own identities being boxed in like in other characters too like you know the gang that hangs out in front of a uh, grandpa allen's house like the one that was a uh, the one that was kid that was killed i've got his name but like you see how he is kind of like he's kind of seems like conflicted himself with like you know is like you know he gets taunted by his own friends you know he's he has like he you could tell he's torn by it and and he's just like he has he feels boxed by this like idea that he has to be like a certain way and in a way it kind of reminded me of the uh film moonlight different subject matter but you can see this idea of like the identity the theme of identity being played out you know this especially like this like masculine identity is particularly like in african american communities you know you have to be a certain way walk a certain way talk talk a certain way you have to like you know, we put on a tough act. You have to put on a tough act, even though, like, even um, even Jimmy says later on in the film, like when he's confronted on during the play scene, like, you know, I, I forgot that what he said word for word, but it was kind of beautiful. Like, we're all not, we're all not just one person. We're all not just one thing, and it very much encapsulates like this whole idea of like, you know, like how society just like keeps us in this box. You know, we have to be a be a certain way you know act a certain way and 
and pretty much like you can see how this played out by the end of the film where he you know torn by knowing the truth about you know grandpa didn't actually build that house like you know yeah has no story to go by and he particularly leaves san francisco you know san francisco but in truth san francisco lost him like it lost due to gentrification like you can you can see this happening like overall like the story is like being told like how well wealth is it more wealth people of more well higher incomes and wealth like it's kind of like destroying like I can say it, like the cultural foundations, the cultural beginnings and upbringings of, of, of these kind of these these types of cities where yeah, there's like a lot of richness to it, and you know, do the wealth poverty and, and and like like the massing of the of the housing market, like and you see how this is like destroying like our own our own stories. Like I'm rambling now, but like yeah, I'm, you get what I'm getting getting at like. It, just destroying our own cultural foundations pretty much. Yeah, um, that's pretty much it. Yeah, thank you, Emilio. You know, for me, um, the movie is very Baldwinian in the sense of how Emilio was talking about telling of these stories, right? Baldwin's project, when you read his work, is really to get us to do away with these stories, right? To to unmask these masks that we place on ourselves to make us feel comfortable or to make us fit into what society tells us that we have right and if you think about the work of um i forget jonathan major's character in the play that he's conducting is really to get us to take off of these stories right to get us to take off of these ledges that we tell ourselves you don't have to be hard right you don't have to believe in this idea that your grandpa built this house so that shapes your identity let's get beyond that you know so i, I felt a lot of baldwin throughout the film Who's next? Uh, I can go. Uh, I'd like to go. Oh, oh. do it. Uh, I I go ahead. Um, so I wanted to uh, also go off like some of the gentrification stuff. So uh, I started off by like, trying to see like, the importance of the house. So uh, first I I looked at like where he currently lives. They're saying that it's like there's toxic stuff in the water. It's dangerous because like they just they killed his friend at the uh, like at, by the middle of the film, uh, Kofi. Um, and then the priest is complaining that they're cleaning the water, like, and that they've been asking for years for them to clean the water, but they're not doing it until now, because the truth is, it's probably one of the neighborhoods that's probably going to get gentrified soon. More white people are going to start moving in, taking, like, space, and then raising the living costs, and eventually they're all going to have to leave. Um, so I guess to Jimmy, the house that his grandpa, uh, quote-unquote, built, uh is like a safe place it's like where he used to live so in a way he's trying to go back and re-gentrify like with his own old like neighborhood like neighbors uh, and get them all back to that old neighborhood and get i guess get some white flight going <laughs> going on and take it all back but as as we know it doesn't end up working out for him because he ends up getting kicked out of the house and he tries to get it back by getting a loan, but the bank, there's still that sc discrimination, so they don't give it to him, even though he seems to have a good job, like, in a nursing home. And he seems to be making an okay amount of money since he's able to pay for half of the, the rent of the house. Um, so uh, then he eventually accepts that his grandpa didn't build the house. And he has to go back, but he finds that they no longer accept him in his old neighborhood. And he already accepted that he's not a part of the old one where his uh, grandpa supposedly built the house. Um, so eventually he leaves and he doesn't come back. He doesn't look back. Uh, yeah, that's that's what I got from that. <laughs> Um, something else that I thought was interesting while watching it was how when he came back with the flowers, no, not with the flowers, when he came back after uh, Kofi had seen the house and they were insulting him, it kind of reminded me of like an old story that I heard about like crabs that are in a pot where the pot is boiling and the one crab is trying to get out. But as soon as it like it's about to get out, the other crabs pull it down. 
and eventually they all boil and they die. And I don't know, I just thought like how they were, they're all just bringing each other down and there's like no room for success or trying to improve. And I thought that, I don't know, <laughs> that probably shouldn't be a thing that happens very often, but it does. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's a really good point, Isaac. And that's really something to be attentive to because it, it, it plays out, this phenomenon of cra crabs in a barrel plays out at a variety of levels, right? So you have the intra-community of crabs in a barrel to where, you know, a black man don't want to see another black man being successful because that's going to reflect badly. They think it will reflect poorly on him, right? Um, then you see that at a broader context to where you have, quote unquote, not, you know, minority or minoritized groups playing the game of crowds in a barrel also, right? To where one minority, so-called minority group doesn't want the other so-called minority group to advance because that's going to look poorly on them. So they'll both pull them down, right? Um, so this is very smart to be attentive to that. But also keep in mind how this plays out on a larger scale as well, right? It's not always just um, indigenous people pulling indigenous people down or black folks pulling down black folks, right? It plays out on a broader level, broader level as well with these two, with groups who have been positioned or have been racialized or who've been minoritized or who've been marginalized, they also get caught up in this crabs in a barrel phenomenon. That's where you have what they call the oppression Olympics, right? So where the Jews will say, well, our Holocaust was bad and the black folks will be like, well, it ain't as bad as slavery, right? So now we're fighting to see who's been the most oppressed. Crabs continuing to pull each other down, right? So that's a, that's a very good analysis. Wh who's next? Oh, sorry, I'll go. Uh, so I saw this movie back when it was in theaters, um, said twice, but um, I remember when the, when the movie was over, uh, I saw Joel, uh, Joel, sorry, Joel Talbot's name, I think the director of the movie, and I was like, oh, a white person, you know, telling this story, well, you know. But then, like, um, you know, I read that, you know, um, Jimmy F uh, Fels, who's one of the, you know, the ma uh, he plays, uh, oh, he plays himself, yeah, this is Jimmy. Um, and I have a friend in San Francisco, because, you know, also he's in the film community, and he was telling me that Joey Talbot is, like, a, also from uh, San Francisco, and how um, they were, you know, they grew up in that same neighborhood and they were always always making movies him and jimmy and um and i was looking at that you know perspective and it's like okay like um although you know he's a um white director um doesn't mean that you know he uh i mean he's attached to the place he's attached to the story he's you know brings fr uh, big friends with jimmy and um so i was like okay like i, I you know kind of try to rationalize from that point of view because i feel like you know um when the movie came out, like, I think I was, you know, in that, I think I was like, okay, like, you know, I love how directors are telling, you know, like, like people of color, you know, are telling stories about, you know, because, uh, like, when Moonlight came out and when, um, what's the movie that came out last year, the uh, the one with uh, Aquafina, um, the Chinese one. Um, uh, Crazy Rich Asians. The Farewell. The Farewell, yeah, thank you. Um, and I saw, like, you know, um a lot of more representation of um on film and i was like you know but yeah like um so i saw this you know a story about like you know again jimmy is very involved in this movie and then um everybody's from san francisco so like that's um i think that you know was very ge genuine for me like you know seeing like um you know this filmmaker telling a story about their um own place and another thing that um i think i was revising is um I think with Montgomery, uh, Jonathan Smith's character, and I think Professor, you brought up um, earlier how like, you know, he's that um, the theater guy, like observant, you know, taking like notes in his um, notepad and, uh, and uh, the other, you know, um, little like um, the, I think it's like the guy's name is, uh, I have it right here, Kofi, like the, I think the guy who gets killed. Yeah, Kofi. Kofi and like the Kofi's gang always saw him as like okay this guy is like you know out of place and um I feel that on uh, cinema we always tend to associate you know um like here's stereotypes with certain you know ethnicities and I was and I loved you know that Jonathan Major um broke out of the you know and had that uh, type of character and oh, honestly like I'm seeing him in other shows in other movies he's always playing, you know, like a different character. And I love, you know, to see that more. Um, I was, you know, happy to see it on screen. And 
I want to do something similar to the movie too. Uh, this is more like, you know, personal things. Um, back home in Mexico, my par- uh, my grandparents' house, um, well, right now they're trying to fix it up. So um, it will be sold and all the money will go to like my uncles. And um, But my mom and my siblings and I, um, we live in that house because my dad and my mom have a couple issues and um so we kind of grew up in that house although it's my grandparents house uh we lived in there for like 10 years and it's a special place for me and now i'm kind of like dealing with like my uh tios and tias uncles and aunties like trying to sell the house and they're gonna get the money but for me it's like you know that place was a place i grew up you know it's like i don't know i was very against uh against it because like you know um but also it wasn't mine it was my grandparents so i was always trying to like this place is like you know uh where i can feel safe but it's also not my place to begin with so i always had that duality to like you know my teenager years and um seeing that scene when uh jimmy's uh character goes to a bank and he's asking for a loan and he's like okay you can screw me like you know i don't care like you know what type of um things are gonna be paying you know um like I, I want like you know get this money so i can buy this house and you know because it's so important to me so like uh that scene by itself i was just like you know um very moved and very uh a little bit like uh emotional with it and also um everything that happens in the play um how jimmy was saying like okay like um yeah people are not one thing or the other like uh coffee was not a bad person. Although he told me, uh, although last time I saw him, he told me very mean things. I, you know, I still have good memories of him, you know, growing up. And I think everybody in that room had, you know, the memories of Kofi. Although he was a tough guy, he was always um, messing around with everybody. He indeed, like, had, like, that other side that people knew, uh, people who knew him uh, personally. And and then again, you know, in that same scene when, you um, uh, Montgomery tells Jimmy that this is not your house um that was another um I think like that was like the core part of like you know him doing that um the 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 the, the play is like you know uh he didn't know how to tell his best friend you know <laughs> that this was his house and that you know he knows and um I think Jimmy's dad also knew about it but you know uh, told his son the lie that you know his grandpa built his house, but um, I don't know. It's just a couple of things I picked up. Yeah, Alejandro, you actually touched on uh, on some really good points. Um, one, I want to first jump into the stereotype. So, if we think about our last reading from the unpacking unthinking Eurocentricism um, reading, and they gave us like the five stereotypes of black representation in film. Um, to Alejandro's point. This film does a great job of problematizing those stereotypes, right? So you have the 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 black buck, the black buck or the black brute stereotype, right? And with Jonathan's major's character and Jimmy, they really poke holes at that, right? And, and it shows the fallacy behind this idea of the black brute. And in the film's method of doing that, it does a great job of humanizing the black experience. Right, so I think that was a very good point that you brought up. And then, you know, you started your conversation out around this notion of representation. And you're saying, you know, that you found it was a, a white director, another white director telling a black story, right? But then upon further research, you knew that him and Jimmy worked closely together. Um, hearing you say that kind of made me think of some films we came across in my visual methods course. And, and the producer of the film is Gene Roach, Roach or something like that. I don't know if you guys are familiar. Um, but there's this film documentary that he has called Jaguar, right? And, and essentially what he does is he's filming these um, brothers in West Africa who are traveling, for, I, I want to say from um, one part, I want to say from like Senegal to Ghana. But the way that it's shot, right? So Roach is doing the filming, but the, the narration are the people who's traveling, right? So when you talk about representation, although it's a white person holding the camera, right? The story's still being told from authentic space because he's allowing the, su- the quote unquote subjects that he's viewing to tell their story, right? Um, another film that we watched like in a juxtaposition to that is a film called Nanook. 
I know you got some of you may have seen it. It's supposed to be like a really big film in, in, in the film canon, but it's a, 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 a filmmaker going into Alaska and he's filming the Eskimos, right? But the agency that Roach gave his characters in Jaguar is not present in the film on the Nook, right? So it's very much tropish, right? It's very much trying to represent stereotypes of Eskimo people, juxtaposed to just allowing the Eskimo peoples to do what they do, right? He doesn't find the main character's actual name. He just assigns him a name that means bear, right? So the difference between how representation can be told and how it can be presented, right? Both of them are white filmmakers, correct? But one of them, Roach, did his projection with care, right? He made sure that who he's filming is brought into that process and their voices presented with agency. Whereas to the um, filmmaker who did Nanook, he wasn't, more in, wasn't so interested in that or concerned with that, right? So what Alejandro's comments made me think about was this notion of, of representation as it relates to filmmakers' method, right? So if you are attentive to how you're going to go about your method of film producing, could also allow you to be attentive to how you want to represent a community that you may not be a part of, right? So those are very good points. Um, who's next? I can go next. Okay. Um, so, uh, the, I mean, I wanted to talk about, um, Alejandro was talking about the, um, the scene where um, he says uh, in the during the play he says that um, nobody like no one is just like one person like people are um, like seen through different perspectives depending on who they are and I think that um, that when in the film when they they bring up that topic it it points out um, something about film and also something about humanity and I think that in uh, when it comes to film we often see like characters as one thing we see like because like through storytelling we kind of need to see them one way in either in order to uh like push a, a specific narrative that we want which doesn't necessarily allow for the complexity that is like actual like humanity and and real people and i think that also like that specifically points out like something about um when it comes to like represent on-screen representation of um, minoritized groups in uh, film, we often very specifically fall into those stereo like those stereotypes of um, each kind of person that there is in the world, and we don't um, and pushing those like one that those like singular faceted stereotypes of each kind of person kind of perpetuates the idea that those that people in real life are only that one thing and that they are not um, as like multifaceted and complex as they actually are. Um, and then I also wanted to talk about um, there's one quote in uh, from the reading uh, at the bottom of page 153 that talks about um, that says uh, as, fan, as Fanon's work shows, uh, all bodies are shaped by the histories of colonialism, which makes the world white, a world that is inherited or which is already given before the point of an individual's arrival. This is the familiar world, uh, the world of whiteness, as a world we know implicitly. Colonialism makes the world white, which is, of course, uh, a world ready for certain kinds of bodies, as a world that puts certain objects within their reach. And I think that that, that kind of took me towards uh, two different ways of thinking, and one of them was that um, I was sorry. I was thinking about um, like color theory and how we often uh, see, in at least in America, and like popular culture, we see white as like a symbolism for purity. Um, and I think that <laughs> we are definitely like socialized to associate like white with purity and and black with um, like negative connotations. And um, I think that um, it made me think about how um, we're also socialized to, because we are socialized to see like white as pure, we see it as like the original as well. So it often makes us, uh, we're like, we're socialized to believe that, um, you know, everything kind of came from the white man, like every, every like major discovery, every um, thing like that, it all came from a white man when in reality, we don't 
um, like that's not actually the truth. We often just hear um, like the story of the first white man who did it, even if it was uh, someone of a different race who did it first. Um, and that made me think about um, in the film, uh, the scene where um, he's standing in the house and there's like the tourist group uh, down below and he's uh, telling, and the tourist group is saying that, um, you know, this, was ha this house was built at this certain time and he's saying, no, my grandfather actually built this house, da 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 da, and uh, the tourist group just kind of like listens to him and kind of like, is like, oh, okay, and then they just move on. Um, and that makes me think about how like typically when, uh, like regardless of like the level of like, like we later find out that his grandfather didn't actually build the house, but regardless of whether what the, uh, the black person is saying is true or not, uh, it often is that when someone's, uh, when a black person states, oh, well actually like, this happened first, we we did this first, you know, whatever. It's often that white people just kind of like placate them and then move on and forget about it. Um, because we are so conditionalized to see like whiteness, at, like this as a white world that was created by white people and it was, it is for white people and that is it. And anything outside of that norm, we kind of just push aside and we don't want to think about um, anything like that. Um, and then the other thing that I, and then that same quote also made me think about um, how, um, like in the LGBT community, we often uh, see like that we often say that like straight is the default. Um, and so it was making me think about how, um, like in this world, being like a cisgendered uh, straight white man is uh like the like the default in a sense and then the second that you have any kind of uh change whether it's your your gender or your skin color or uh your sexuality or anything like that um it brings on a um a higher level of scrutiny um and that scrutiny um and that like the like with what with the white gaze and everything um kind of is what uh disallows uh, the people to have the same reach um, as like the cisgendered white straight man. Um, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point, Sam. Um, recommended reading for you as it pertains to what you just mentioned. Um, James Baldwin has a book called Giovanni's Room, and he deals explicitly with what you're talking about. Um, just how, you know, this notion of white supremacy or white inferiority or whiteness is very, very myopic, right? Like white male, Christian, heteronormative, wealthy, right? It's a very, very small um, signifiers that symbolize the ideal depiction of whiteness, right? And, and so really what Baldwin is kind of problematizing and trying to unpack is how whiteness even impacts white people who don't fit into this myopic depiction of what whiteness is. So um, yeah, if you have time, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool um, read on how, you know, whiteness affects, sorry, white supremacy or white inferiority affects even white folks. So that's, that's a really good point. Um, who's next? I'll go next. Okay. Um, I just want to start by uh, uh, quoting this, uh, this quote that I found in the book says that uh, whiteness could be described as an ongoing fin unfinished history which orientates bodies in a specific direction affecting how they take up space. Uh, to me, that means that um, the very second you're born, you're born into this white world. And uh, I was born in uh, Mexico, in uh, Chiapas, like the last state of Mexico. And I came here when I was nine years old. I came here not knowing uh, how to speak English, and uh, it was really, really difficult for me to uh, to uh, get used to this new world for me because it was it was so different from uh, where I lived. Where I live, it's, uh, it's a, it was really like a humble place, and when I came here, like everything, just like everything that I knew that I knew was right, ended up being like seeing it from a different point of view, in which I didn't like, I didn't feel comfortable with. And um, I was just uh, a couple years later. A couple years later, uh, I attended high school, and uh, I was afraid of uh, of continuing like my life in this world because uh, 
the very institutions created here were meant for, you know, specifically for one type of people, which is like white people. And um, I'm, I felt afraid to go into the world and go to college because uh, I didn't think I had the opportunities to go to. I didn't have the financial help to go to. And uh, when the DACA, DACA passed, uh, that granted me like an orientation, like not an orientation, but like it, it, it paved the way for me to, uh, to like rethink about my existence here in the United States and uh, think about how, what I want to do in this, in this world, in this, in the, in California, what I want to do. And it totally reinvented everything that I knew and I wanted to do and accomplished. And, uh, and, uh, and I think about the, the writing this is like this, the very space that I take in this, in this, uh, in this state, in this country is the very space that I'm like, I'm, I, that I, that I chose to continue to take up that space, even though that space is not created for me. Uh, uh, one, there's a section that the authors uh, points out that, that for me, people like me are like points of deviation in the world, in the map. And that's how I see myself like, I could have easily, for example, uh, you know, after high school, started working the minimum wage but I didn't. I decided to go to university and, uh, you know, learn and get a degree, get a degree and uh, make my parents proud, make them, uh, make them uh, think that, uh, yeah, yeah, that you could make it here with your son graduating from a university, a four-year college. And uh, one thing I also want to point out is that uh, uh, a lot of my cousins here, we, we came at the, at the same time uh, when, when I was nine. And uh, it's really critical to me that uh, that we all decided to take like different routes. Like I lived in most of here, and when uh, when I came here, I lived in uh, in here in La Puente, California, and my cousin lived. Uh, they decided to live in uh, in East LA, while their parents decided to, and they grew up differently than how I grew up here, because right here, there was no like gangs, but over there in East LA, like there was a lot of gangs. So they decided to find that normal and become associated with. And uh, they ended up not going to college, not graduating high school. And uh, for me, it's just, it, it bothers me to think that, uh, the, that, uh, that there's, there's institutions that make you think that that just because you're not born in here, that you're, I can't put this two words, that you're meant to be part of a gang. You're like, you either choose to be part of a gang or either get an education. And uh, also I wanna point out the, the thought that he mentions that uh, about this scenario about him, uh, about, I think it's Franz Wanan that, that said that, that he's sitting in a, in a chair in his desk and uh, he's reaching for, for a cigarette. And the direction that he's taking is the direction that most of us like, like take. And that could be like more symbolic than what he means. It could take, it could mean a lot of things, I think. Like the cigarette, the very like act of smoking the cigarette, it, it could be not good for your health. It could actually kill you. It could actually lead you to kill, to kill you like slowly. And the creation of it was a creation of white men like that. Cigarettes were created by white men. And some people use it to, uh, to, feel, to feel less, I guess, stressed. And all I could think about is how like, how, for example, if I was a smoker, I would come to, I would come home and I would smoke and I'll be okay with it because that's the reaction that smoking does that after a long day of working in like in the, in the capitalist system that you're reminded that you can't, that you have to work at the minimum wage 
that you have to uh, pay rent, that you have to take care of family, that you can't, that you can't for example, uh, be successful because you got a lot of things to finish first. And the last thing that you do that you have into reach is a, is a cigarette that release, like release that, that stress. And to me, that uh, that that seems like very symbolic into like whatever object, whatever institution we reach. How do we take? How do we? How do we? How do we make sense of that? How do we make sense of those objects? How do we make sense of those, those institutions? How do we pave our own way into into understanding, for example, this world that's created uh, for white people and. Uh, the author also mentions that uh, it's not it's not about like how is the world about. Uh, I forgot what I was gonna say. Now I lost my train of thought, <laughs> but that's how I want to end anyway. Yeah, uh, man, you said said a lot, bro, um, and you're quite on point with your analysis. So I, what I, what I want to address a couple of things, and I'll work backwards. But as far as you talking about um, the non articulating, if you want to smoke a cigarette, right, I'm gonna go into my drawer. I'll pull the matches out the drawer. I know that my squares are in my pocket, right? Yeah. And seeing that I do these things almost implicitly, right? Like it doesn't take any real mental cognitive work to do that. Um, I do it almost on autopilot. And what he's describing is the corporal schema, which is called like the body is at rest, right? So to your point, you're saying like, this is what you do after your day of work you, to relax yourself. You smoke a square, right? So to decompress your, um, your stress of the day. Mm -hmm. So what Fanon is articulating is what's called the corporal schema, which is when the body can be comfortable, when the body could be at rest. So with the way that you're making your analysis is spot on, right? And what he's doing, he's providing a juxtaposition between the corporal schema, the body that becomes at rest, when it becomes comfortable, which in this world is the white, the white body is the only body that could operate or exist within the corporal schema because it's in a world that is oriented towards them, right? Then you have your um, racial historical schema, right? Where he says, I've been, my reality has been made for me by the other, detailed out of a thousand stories, anecdotes, and details, right? That's your racial historical schema. And then it's the um, epidermal schema, your epidermis, your skin, right? So he's talking about these three different schemas. But what you're talking about is how this corporal schema relates to rest and it relates to relaxation, right? Which is spot on. But then you're, you're also talking about how, and when I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about really how closely your scenario works with the main character of the movie, Jimmy, right? Because, you know, you say, I, I'm coming from Mexico to a place that's really not mine and I don't feel comfortable navigating this locale, right? But to me, if I think from my standpoint of history, right? Like from shit, from South America to Canada, this is all Mexico. Like let's just call it what it is, historically, right? This is all one, one body of land that was occupied by indigenous people, which is your ancestors, right? So really what you're doing, like Jimmy, is trying to come back home. <laughs> you're trying to come back home to a, your home that's been gentrified, right? Your original home, they have made it to where it's not, where your body is not welcome there. And you're trying to find your way to navigate through this space, reclaim your land back as Jimmy's trying to reclaim his home back, right? And, and put your flag down in this space, right? Or take your home back, right? So to me, like, I, and I don't know, I may be speaking for you or putting that into your words, but as I'm listening to you, this is what's being invoked in my mind, right? It's like, for all, and that's why I call it indigenous people, because this is your land to begin with, right? This land was stolen from you. Right, so that's that's the first act of harm. That's the first act of violence was the stealing of your land, right? So also, I also want to point out that uh, I I do have like indigenous blood in me. I think like a lot majority of it, probably like like sixty seventy percent. I don't know. I've never taken the a test, <laughs> but my feature that you could tell. And but uh, but watching the film, it uh, yeah, it made me it made me stand in the and like put in my put uh I would call it uh, being in the shoes of like the main character Montgomery and how you know when he has he has to act a certain way he he can't act like other like the other group of people that were there and they were being themselves you know mm -hmm. but 
uh, because uh, you know all the institutions tell you that you have to act a certain way. The main character, like, he has to suppress all those all those emotions, even though he wants to uh, like like express himself. Like his other like other the other group, like like me sometimes like I can't express myself. You know, like like other like uh, people that are from Mexico. Like like I don't know how to say it, but the how do I put this to words that uh, that sometimes uh, I don't want to be associated with, you know? And yeah, I can't think of anything else to explain. But I think too that it's important to, to point out and to understand, like the, the, I think the film is arguing, and then correct me if I'm wrong, that yeah. those characters on the corner, they weren't being themselves. Right, they were being who they were, un who they understood what blackness should be. Right, so like they're trying to fit into the stereotype of what blackness is, and I, and I think what they're trying to get at in the play is that once we kind of break out of these stereotypes and these entrapments, it's no telling what they could be. Right, like there's a whole untapped energy that is residing in these individuals that gets um, muted or dilated because they want to be hard on the block because that's what blackness is. Right, so so I, I think they don't know who they are because they're just living up to this idea or this ideal of what they should be. Yeah, but very good point. Um, do you want to add on to that, Alexis, or do you want, to, or do we move on? Or can we no, move? no. Thank you for correcting me. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't see it in that point of view, but now I understand that. I appreciate that. Right. Who's next? Is it me? Am I the last one? Yeah, you and Luis Hero. So either way. I always want to go, it don't matter. I think I was last now. Nah. Or should I just go? All right, just go. All right, go ahead. Um, well, what I got from the reading, the uh, abstract part that Hamed had mentioned, I basically, she said like, in an overall summary was like the paper was her diving into the experience of a world for a non-white body while exploring the whiteness of this world and presenting the institutional habits. And uh, just speaking on what you guys had said too, we uh, can all agree that whiteness has seemed regular and it's, Im it's embedded in society and ultimately considered, you know, the standard. And uh, I was funny because I was, what I was gonna say was like how we all know it's considered the standard but when you try to say how white privilege and address it to many people, they deflect the, the whole thing. They like try to, you know, you know, chime down the whole thing as, as if it's like an invisible mark of privilege. That's what she has said. And I, that's crazy to me because that's so true. Like, you know, there's all these things that we can speak on and attest to that go hand in hand with, you know, white privilege. And then when, when you bring it up, they, they just simply deflect it and like, you know, put it down. But, uh, uh, I was gonna say not just black people in it, but she also mentioned everyone experiences a form of whiteness because it's wor it's worldly. Everyone's form just is different in its own, you know, fucked up way. But to say, it, but you know, that's just what it is. And um, and then going into the witness as an orientation, you guys, man, you guys basically you nailed it already. You basically spoke on it with the uh, the Fanon. You and uh, Alexis were talking about how the Fanon uh, experience of the corporal scheme and like. Um, I mean, speaking from black people, I don't know how it is for other people's race, but for black people, it's just something we experience. Like how she said, it, she basically, she nailed that shit when she said like, uh, I think it was like, uh, it's it's a spiritual configuration that is passed down in history that reaches an escape of smoking and being, the, the, his reach of escape of smoking and being oriented towards an object is that body at home, that feel and that personal escape. Conditions are passed down through not just blood, or our genes, but labor of generations. And like when Fanon said he grabbed a cigarette because it was a form of him releasing from his body and just like kind of being at, at still, not at comfortable, cause you're not comfortable, but it's just like, you're being kind of like, it's a moment of just like, like not emptiness, but you're just like still for the moment. Cause you just don't want to like, not like I would say confront the situation, but you know the situation and you know, you can feel that, that energy and uh, you know, as a black person, we all go through that experience in some way, whether it's smoking a cigarette or it's like holding on to your basketball when you got some motherfuckers coming up to you talking shit. Like, is anything like it's just like something you're conformed to just because it's like how you said, like that that conscious like takes over and like you know it just 
it's just something like instincts type, you know, and, and some people like experiences are different from like the black perspective. I just speak on my perspective. I can't speak on anyone else's, but, and um, yeah, that shit was deep. Cause you know, like growing up, you know, like being, I have, I'm, you know, growing up in Boston and then also coming out here to Southern California, but all my family's from the South. So it's like, all my family grew up like from the South, like they're from South Carolina, Georgia area. So they, you know, you go through your own experiences, but they tell you their experiences and how you need to react to certain things, but you don't really think much of it as a child until you get to that situation. You're like, oh shit, this is what they're talking about. This is how I need to handle it. But I think Fanon's even speaking more about it's just like your own, like your own experience and you know how you don't even really need those talkings. You just feel it and you go through it on your own without even going through those discussions. But, uh, and then uh, another thing that I got out of the, um, the segment that said whiteness as an orientation, and Hamed has speak on whiteness is a uh, not cons not necessarily considered a reachable object, but just a, a simply an orientation that puts certain things within obtainability. So it's like you can you can't never reach you can never be like this whiteness that we are and reach this level, but you can get in the room and and and, and eat some of the stuff we can eat and you know be a part of some of the things. But that also I was saying that's that's also true, but that also goes to like as long as you conform to what they want you to be and what they want you like, you know, you have to, you have to move a certain way. You have to act a certain way. If you like are too black or you too, whatever you are, like, they don't like that shit. Like, you know, if, if Tiger Woods was like fucking Deion Sanders, they wouldn't like that shit. Like that's, you know what I'm saying? Like that's that type of shit I'm talking about. Like, and it's, it's just what it is. Like, you know, you see this shit and you learn and you just like this shit crazy. But I mean, it's, um, whiteness is inherited throughout the world. And, you know, like you said, that's inherited throughout the world, not just America, throughout the whole world and it's reproduced and it becomes a form of the world. It's just, it's, it's normal. And uh, I know I'm talking a lot, my fault. The, uh, the, hab the habitual worlds, that section, uh, the habitual action, how it's a form of inheritance. And um, whiteness is like, it's second, like, you know, I just keep saying second nature. It's just something we all kind of like, we just grow accustomed to. We only, it's like I said earlier in, this, in the, in the uh, semester, it's something like, you don't even realize sometimes the shit until you really like dive into it and you're like, oh shit, like that's, you know, like, you don't, you don't even realize until you get old and you start learning stuff. But um, the, also the last thing on habitual worlds that stood out to me was what you guys spoke on the institutionalized, like the way they run it. And I, the main thing I think she mentioned that stood out to me was like the recruits, like the, ideo the ideology of, of the acts and functions of recruits. Cause there's a lot of fucking like goofies out here who are like perfect A grade recruits for that type of shit, for that white supremacy look. Like, you know, you got your proud boys and you're like, you know, all that type of stuff. Like those are your certain recruits that you, that they target to keep this institutionalized, like, like faith going, this belief, like this, like this whole stigma. And that was like, that was a stood out to me. Cause I was like, damn, she's right. Like if it wasn't for these, the way that they recruit these certain people and bring and like, you know, get to them and brainwash them and, and get them into what they want. That's, that's what keeps it alive and keeps it going. So, um, yeah. And then, uh, the last part being not being not, I just said, uh, Fanon's phenomenology about motility and uh, express again about the, the pressure, you know, just like, you know, the bodily surface of being a, a, a black person. And then also like, uh, there was something, I can't remember where she said it, but uh, I think Amanda spoke on like, where you um, becoming an object and the crisis of uh, losing your place and being almost in third person. Like she said something about like, when you kind of want to like, you're in an area and you don't want to, you don't even want to be noticed and you don't want to stand out. You just want to be in the background and fade. But like, sometimes you can't even do that. Just being like, being like black. You can't, you can't, like you, you always stand out. You always like, motherfuckers going to be like, who is that? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like you just, you can't just like go into an elevator and just be like, no one look at you. Everyone be like, oh shit, who is this person? You know what I'm saying? Like whether it was whatever time, you know, I don't know. It's just, that shit stood with me. Cause it was like, sometimes I'd be wanting to go places and like, I be on my bummy shit. Like I got my slippers and my hoodie on. I don't want no one to be, people still gonna look at you like some type of way. I'm like, damn bro, I'm just trying to get my shit and go. Like, and uh, and yeah, man, like I'm just speaking it from like a, from a personal, like local, like small perspective, but you know, this is high, obviously effective on a <clears throat> wider scale and a, a bigger, a bigger level. But uh, yeah, man, that's really all I got from, I mean, not all I got, I shouldn't say all I got, but, uh, and then regarding the movie, it's like my second time or my third time watching this movie. It, uh, I mean, you guys spoke on it a lot. I will say the one thing, 
the one thing to me about the movie that stood out to me, I don't know how, how accurate I am about this, but like the one thing that stood out to me, it's going to sound kind of crazy, but like, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you obviously like the certain things, how, you know, you were just speaking on with the, the laughing can those, that type of stuff. Like you only hear that stuff when you, when you talk to older folks and they tell you certain stories and you're like, damn, that shit crazy. Like, cause certain shit you tell people and they wouldn't believe you. Like I seen that video with Chris, Chris Rock talking about, his mom going to the vet to get her dentist, her teeth done. Like she didn't go to the dentist. She went to the fucking vet to get her teeth done. Like people don't believe that shit, but it's like, that's real shit. And like, that's like, my grandma can tell me stories. So they're like, when you like, that goes back to the whole thing about the, the like people about white privilege, how they deflect, not just white pri privilege, but when you try to bring this type of shit up, they deflect that or they'll like try to justify be like, well, that was like 50 something years. It's like, bro, come on now. My grandma was alive for that shit. That means my great grandma went through this shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like they all experience this shit, but uh, going back to the movie, I will say though, like another thing that stood out to me <laughs> about the, um, just black people was uh, how his pops felt the, the need to feel like like above the world and success saying that his, his father built that house. Like that's another thing that kind of like I noticed with black people is like when you grow older, not just black people, I'm sure anyone like, you know, of any extent, you can say when you grow older and you start to realize who your aunts and your uncles and your parents are, it's like, you're not who I really, you know, not say you're not who I thought you was, but like, you know, not like that, but you see certain things and you start to grow and you realize like, just like, I'm not perfect. You're not, you're not perfect. Like, you know, as a kid, you think like you're on your uncle's perfect and all this and that. And like, you hear these stories and it's like, that's not how it was. That's, you know, and that realization that, um, that he, that he had that like, you know, it was just like, I think it was just deeper than just like, it was way deeper than just like, oh, my, 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 my grandpa didn't make this, he didn't build this house. Like, I think it goes to like, I don't know, that was just, that was just me, that was just me, that's just me. No, I think you, you, you're onto something though, Tyler, because like really, it put the character in an existential crisis, right? Like he built his whole identity, he built his whole reality around the fact that his grandfather built this house. And then due to that fact, right, he, he's separate from his peers, right? Because like one of the critiques that, um, I don't know why I'm forgetting his name now. Uh, Kofi had of him was like, oh, he used to always tell us this story about this house like he was better than us, right? So implicitly in that, even for Jimmy, he would tell those stories to kind of separate himself from all of those who were around him. Because and think about it too, he was in an orphanage at the time when he met Kofi, right? So at a time where you have nothing, you don't even have your parents, right? What does it mean to say that my grandfather built this house? It gives you a whole nother sense of self. It gives you a whole nother sense of assurance, right? Um, it gives you an identity, you know? Nah, you're right, you're right, you're right. And then I'm also, I was listening to you talk about just the, the Fanon and, and you said something to the effect of, you know, like this is what I deal with on a small scale, although it's a very large scale issue, right? But it's really, not been small about it to the point that he dedicated a whole, what, 200, a 206 page book to this subject matter, right? Um, to be completely honest, this is probably my least favorite book about that Fanon wrote, um, this Black Skin, White Mask, because it, it gives me a visceral a, a feeling of visceral effects, right? Like, it's the kind of, situate you guys. Let's kind of read you, I'm gonna read you, read you the opening, right? And kind of some of the things that, that he's, he wants to do. And I'll kind of show you. Why am I writing this book? Nobody asked me to, especially not for those whom it is intended. So in all sincerity, my answer is that there are too many idiots on this earth. And now that I have said it, I have to prove it. Striving for a new humanism, understanding mankind, our black brothers, I believe in you. Man, racial prejudice, understanding and love. I'm gonna skip down a little bit. What does, what does man want? Question mark. What does the black man want? Question mark. Running the risk of angering my black brothers, I shall say that a black is not a man. Again, I'm gonna read that to you. Running the risk of angering my black brothers, I shall say 
that a black is not a man. There is a zone of non-being, an extraordinarily sterile and ardent region, an incline stripped bare, stripped bare of every essential form which a new genuine departure can emerge. In most cases, the black man cannot take advantage of this descent into a variable hell. So that fucks with me, right? Like just this whole idea that I'm not a man, right? And then he goes on to say that what the black man wants is to be white, right? And what the white man wants is to be on, become beyond man, right? And then he kind of goes into these all, all of these problems that deal with blackness, right? So the first chapter is the black man in language. The second chapter is the woman of color and the white man. The, the third chapter is the man of color and the white woman. The fourth chapter is the so-called dependency complex of the colonized. The fifth chapter is the lived experience of the black man. So this is that chapter five is where we get the excerpt that Ahmed is reading, right? So it's a lot to kind of deal with, with Fanon's projects and his, his, his idea of making this new human, right? is to strip us of what he calls is our, um, our um, narcissism, right? So there's a, a narcissism within blackness and there's a narcissism within whiteness that he wants to strip us from to produce this new humanism, right? So for me, I'm kind of like, well, hold on for now. Like if to strip me of my black narcissism, right? What does that really mean? There's a lot of positive things that go on to blackness. I forgot, I, I want to say with Sam, who was saying that, you know, we have been put into this binary to where white signifies as, as good and black has been signified as bad, right? So what Fanon's project is, is to strip us from that bifurcation, to strip us from that binary, right? And just start new as humans. Uh, you know, okay, uh, let's, let's, we can play that out. But at the same time, right? There's certain essences to blackness that I don't want to be removed from, right? I like my rhythm. I like the seasoning the way that we season our food, right? I, I like my broad lips and my broad nose. There's certain essences that I don't want to be disalienated from or stripped from, right? So in your project or in your idea of this new humanism, what do you do with what we want to keep, right? So this is like a, like a bigger Fanonian project that I'm dealing with, uh, with, with within myself. But to tie it to what Tyler's talking about, right, is like, fundamentally, how do we deal with this gaze in a real level, right? So when we walk into the elevators and you see the person clutching their purse, how do we, as Black people, respond to that, right? What are our tools or our mechanisms to give ourselves peace of mind, to give ourselves comfort, to make us understand the world at a higher level, right? And, and for me, he doesn't offer those answers in this book. You're left with more questions than you are answers. But what it is, it's a great way to understand a positionality in the world, right? It's a great way to understand that the way that the world is oriented. And ultimately, what you see through the work of Sarah Ahmed, it's a great thing to pick up and start a whole nother project with, right? So she just took an excerpt of a chapter of Fanon's work and she produced a whole article, right? So that's a great example of great intellectual and scholarly work. You're picking up somebody else's project, somebody else's problem, and you turn it into your own problem, right? So it's, it's, that's just a great example of scholarship. Um, I believe our last individual for our fishbowl is Luis. Are you prepared to fishbowl, Luis? Yeah, I just got back. <laughs> all right. Try to stall you out a little bit. It's on I you. Mean, um, I think everybody said what what everybody said was like spot on. I had I kind of like had a lot of similar things to say in that regard, but I guess like the only thing that actually stood out for me was um, this quote by Richard uh, Dyer in in the in the reading where he states a. Uh, he admits to being disturbed by the very idea of what he calls white studies, where he says, my blood runs cold at the thought that talking about whiteness could lead to the development of something called white studies. Honestly, to me, we could argue that we were spoon fed that crap since 
this country was built by the history that they taught us. They never gave us the truth. They gave us their truth, which is the white privileged truth that their that our forefathers founded, which is which isn't honestly all a lie. That's why to me is like, dude, like, I don't know why you guys are complaining about saying that it disgusts you or or that it, it turns your blood cold when you guys have been giving us that crap for eons already. We could think about it in that way. And to me, it's, I don't know, it's just one of those things that is going on right now with the whole election. And I don't know who said the the whole thing about, like, how is it possible that seeing what we're seeing how how innocent people have been killed and have been treated by the police how is that possible that you still see half and half that this election is so close how is that like how how does that even make sense you know why would people even want to be in that situation you know where you're just killing another person just because of their color of their skin I honestly, that, that to me is like, really like that, that's not the intent of the world. That was not the intent of God to bring to us. You know, if you want to bring religion into it, like it's pretty much to love each other, not to destroy each other, not to, you know, make another race or another ethnicity feel less or be less superior than, than one another. You know, that, that to me just kind of stood out. That's why like that little, I guess you could say paragraph or quote really like it stung me. I was like, wow, you're really saying like it, it, it makes you feel this way, but yet this is all we've ever been taught. You know, you, your generation as well, probably got taught the same thing. So it just blows my mind that like, we still, they still, well, you know, people still in general, especially in this country do not want to admit that there is, an issue with the country and how it was founded and there needs to be change and the best change it's to happen now you know this is the time to actually have that change and you know my hope is that it does but like you said with this president you don't we don't know anything man right now he's talking about like oh i'm gonna sue and i'm gonna recount everything i was like bro you just don't like losing man like we get it. Like, you know, you want to win, but the thing is, that's not the way to do it. You're putting your needs instead of the whole nation's need beforehand. You know, that, that to me, just, and people, that's why I don't get like, why are people still voting for him when he's like literally showing he doesn't care about what they think or who they are or anything in general, you know? So yeah, that's why I, that's pretty much all I had to say. And, and that portion, you know, and the movie, honestly, it was the first time I ever seen that movie. But to me, it actually was more about the idea from the beginning to, you know, like everything, you know, like the cinematography, everything that they did just kind of added that notion of like, this is the issue. This is what's wrong. This is what needs to be changed. This is what needs to be worked with, you know, like that whole idea of feeling that you don't belong that's for everyone i feel like especially if you're of color it's it's there and it will always be there and that's honestly that's what i took most from it especially in the part i think it was um um damn, i think it was crystal the one that spoke on it where he goes across the street to shake the guy's hands like oh i'm here you know like I'm going to be the best damn neighbor you have and this and that. But, and the other guy's like, what the hell? Like, what the fuck's going on? Like, who's this guy? That to me just, I don't know, it, it spoke volumes. And I was like, dude, like, this is exactly what's wrong with this world right now. And, well, yeah, that's that's pretty much it, what I took from it. Yeah. So one thing I do want to um, just kind of crystallize of what Luis is saying and, and kind of work it through the article. Because... What Luis is arguing is what the article is arguing, right? But the, the, the Dreyer, so when Dreyer is talking about white studies, he's talking about white studies that are critical of whiteness, 
right? So if you think about like the work of what we just read, Ahmed, you think about um, uh, Orientalism by um, Saeed, Edward Saeed, right? They're critiquing this notion of whiteness. You think about the work of James Baldwin, it's a critique of whiteness. It's not, um, we're gonna teach you this idea of whiteness, because that's just regular schooling. That's just what we get in our, our school system point blank period, which to Luis's point, right? We've been learning whiteness, but how the article is framing white studies is a study that critiques this idea of whiteness. So Ahmed's work in the subsequent pages that follow that opening paragraph is a, is a white studies work, right? She's critiquing this idea of how whiteness is performed and how whiteness shows up in the world. So what Luis is saying is directly aligned with Ahmed's argument, but the terminology and the understanding of white studies is a study that critiques whiteness, not that a study that teaches us whiteness, right? That's the only um, thing that, that I wanna make sure that we crystallize and iron out. Um, but yeah, you know, it, He's right. This is that that's part of what's wrong with the world. And the reason why the split the, the vote was so split down the middle was people don't want to give up this notion of whiteness. They feel secure. Just like how um Jimmy didn't want to give up his house, that was his identity. There's certain segments of the white population that don't want to give up that whiteness because that's their identity, right? Um it was, I think it was one of my um I think it was my pan African studies class, and I, I asked them about reparations. You know, what is reparations? And we talked about how all these other communities received reparations, but Black folks have not received reparations. I mean, to re correct me if I'm wrong, Tyler, if you received some reparations, let me know. Um, Colonias, if y'all received some reparations, let me know. But nobody in my Black circle has yet to receive reparations, right? And so what we came to as a conclusion is the reason why where this one segment of the population who has not received reparations is to give us these reparations is to admit that you were wrong, right? To admit the very foundation of the civilization that we exist in, the foundation that that build on is bullshit, right? So just as Jimmy had a hard time understanding the fact that his, grandma didn't, his grandfather did not build this house, think about a society for over 500 years who believe that they built this society, right? They're not gonna, it's gonna be hard for them to come to the realization that they didn't, right? And, and I'm gonna take it back to Sam's point earlier, when you talk about inventions, right? When you come to like, so Jack, for Jack Daniels, for those who are, are whiskey drinkers, right? Recently it comes, back, it comes out that the recipe for Jack Daniels didn't come from Jack Daniels, it came from one of the individuals who's on his plantation. Right? And then for me, when you look at this country's history and you look at inventions, right? Think, think about how inventions work. Typically, inventions are done to make things better that are hard, correct? Or to make things safer for that matter, right? So in this country's inception, who was doing the work? Black folks. So there's no need for those who are running the plantation to think of an invention to make gardening easier because I'm not gardening, right? There's no desire or no need for that. So when you think about a lot of the inventions, especially as it pertains to work, it only makes sense that they come from the people who are working, right? Like, not, like that, that's not even something like an abstract, theoretical, big ass, no, nah, it's just practical, right? So to Sam's point and to, Luis's point, when you talk about disturbing these histories and disturbing these understood realities, it causes a existential crisis. Just like what Jimmy went through. He had to fucking leave San Francisco. He couldn't deal with it, right? So just to be practical and to look at what we're dealing with when we talk about undermining the society that is steeped and built on racism, it's gonna cause an existential crisis for a vast majority of this country, right? The, 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 the vote was almost split down the middle. So that means half of the country, if we were to disrupt and overturn these things that we seek to overturn to give us justice, are not gonna be able to deal with it. So once things get settled and we know who won and things go the way that we hope that they go, 
we're going to see how crazy shit's going to get because we're going to start to see those who do not want to let go and relinquish the idea of power, right? Um, my mom works for the post office. She's like a government, um, she's like a postal inspector, right? So she's a government agent. So she receives information from government entities. Right? I'm almost embarrassed to say that shit. My mom's a fed, but not like that kind of fed fed, but you know, she, she works for the alphabet boys. Um, so she sends me, she sends our family this um, message that they received from the Secret Service. This comes from somebody in the Secret Service. And so in the NAACP received the credible information that some of the white nationalist groups, neo-Nazis and white supremacist groups have initiations happening this weekend. As part of the initiation, it is said that they will be looking to snatch black men and boys and hang them, shoot them, torture them and kill them. So please spread the word, do not let your sons alone, pay attention to your surroundings. If you have friends with somebody recently not gullible and naive, they may have a, um, another motive, right? So this is just, just trying to give you, this is coming down from state agencies, right? So when I talk about those who do not want to relinquish power, this is what I'm speaking of, right? He already told him, if shit go wrong, stand back, stand down and stand ready, right? This is, this is what he's communicating. So when you're talking about shifting power, we have to think about all of these things that come in play, right? It's not, power is not transferred peacefully, right? It's not transferred without a fight, right? It's not transferred without bloodshed. We're gonna see in the next couple of weeks how he goes about relinquishing his power, right? Because part of the process is to concede your seat in office, right? He already told us, I ain't conceding shit. So how is this gonna play out? which gives us a bigger insight to the bigger picture for the work that I seek to do, right? For my life objective is to snatch this power and reallocate it to the people who don't have it, right? That's what, I, if, if all went well and if Amiri Mazzini's life were to go the way that I would want it to go, that's how it would end for me, right? I'll be able to allocate power to the people who are powerless, right? But I know if that, if I were to be successful, there's gonna be a response to try to get that power back or to maintain that power, right? So we can't be naive in the way that we go about our activity to think that it's just gonna be seamlessly transferred over. Nah, that's not what it is, right? One of my favorite works by Fanon is The Wretched of Earth, Wretched of the Earth. And the opening, the opening paragraph, the opening chapter is on violence, right? And it's on violence, it's a 60 page chapter, right? So he's de he dedicated 60 pages of this book to deal with this idea of violence because he knows power won't be transferred without this phenomenon we call violence, right? It's just, it's just astute political scholarship. It's astute political science. It's astute study of history, right? Um, so we'll, we'll end, but I do want to hear from some, we had a very robust fishbowl, but I do want to hear from some people who didn't get a chance to speak and who want to kind of comment, comment on the reading or the, um, video. Um, can I comment on, I'm, I was going to comment on both, but, um, some things that stood out to me for like the, for the movie was like the opening scene um when the reverend's speaking and they're they're you know jimmy and montgomery are going through the town and it kind of made me think about what um what um ahmed's piece is saying about space and how the imagery you see is like people looking at them like hmm, you know like you don't belong here um and i mean the the line that stood out to me was look at them look at you look down at you, but we built them, referring to the houses. We are these homes, their eyes, their pointed brims. We move if they move, our sweat soaked in the wood. And like that was, make, it made me cry because it's like, oh, it, like they're built in our image is what they said. So it's just this whole thing about space. It's like, who are they to say that we, you don't belong here? You know, when we were, when they were here first, they were there first. Um, also another, um, um, it's kind of like the price, like with gentrification, it got me to think too, with prices, them raising prices is kind of like 
like distributing worth in a way um saying like oh you know when jimmy goes wants to see how much it is to buy rebuy his house it's kind of like well you're not worth this price anymore you know um another um point too um that i want to make is that um the cover the um san francisco flowers in your hair done by mark michael marshall um it's so much better than the original by Scott McKenzie, but it's because like with um, both songs, like they didn't change the lyrics, but there's different meanings behind both songs. The original was kind of like hippie, like, you know, <laughs> flowers in your hair, but um, the Michael Marshall one, it's kind of like he's speaking for his community. It's like they're, it's almost like reclaiming that voice like a like a sense of reclaiming their voice within the city and you could feel that when he's singing that song um the same in the score i heard that like the score um um i um that they were trying to make it sound like um jimmy is like the prince reclaiming his throne um and you could just you could just feel that <laughs> like i don't know that's just the music like makes me emotional <laughs> and it stood out for me because it describes the story but yeah now, I, for me the the opening also was very like highlighted and very like um yeah it had a very powerful effect and, and the monologue as well and then to me it likened for me the black experience to this country right like we built this shit this the our blood sweat and tears is in the soil Right, so that's a, that's a very good point. Um, who else? Yeah, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about it. I I think I was really excited when uh, it was announced that we were gonna watch this movie because this was like one of my favorite movies of 2019, and especially I, there's some bias there because um, I'm from San Francisco, uh, born and raised here, and it was just like like a lot of the points that Tori said, like just the intro was was so amazing when I first saw it in theaters. And I was curious as to how they would depict San Francisco because, you know, from from an outsider, you know, in media, all you think of with San Francisco was like the Golden Gate Bridge and tech companies. And it's more to it than just that. So I was, I was really happy of how they portrayed uh, not even just the bright sides of San Francisco, but even the, the kind of uh, the dark side of San Francisco per se. Um, you know, they showed shots of the Tenderloin, they showed shots of the Mission District, and, and, you know, not that many people know of those neighborhoods or those streets, you know. You know, we tend to, like, not show that side because, of, you know, homeless people and, and crackheads, but, like, that's, that's, our, that's our city. Like, that's, we can't shy away from that. And I, I thought they did a tremendous job of kind of giving um, a kind of fantasized slash realistic uh, take on San Francisco and in the story even though this the story slash plot was a very simple plot of just a man trying to reclaim his home it was really impactful and really powerful with a lot of a lot of subtle uh heavy topics um that you guys have all discussed as well and and it's just really personal to me and especially because I I talked to the director because he's a San Francisco native here so I got to go to a screening with him and I talked to him afterwards and he's a really down to earth guy. He's also a San Francisco native and he's like best friends with Jimmy Fails and they've been working on the movie for, they were working on it for I believe like five years. So it took a lot of planning to go through it and, and it, it's really, just watching the movie, it's really obvious that they, they really cared about this project. They really cared about telling the story because a lot of, the thing that Jimmy goes through or Mott goes through, I think that a lot of San Francisco natives also went through. Like a lot of times me and my family, every time we go for a walk or something, we always just like window shop a lot of the houses near us. Um, because I, my entire life, for my 21 years of living here in the city, I've lived in a one bedroom apartment. You know, we're a family of five. Um, I thought that was normal. <laughs> uh, I've I've just gotten used to that, um, but just the, the idea of owning a home always seemed like a fairy tale to me. So whenever we walk uh, walk around the neighborhood of San Francisco, just seeing these houses or these Victorian style houses, we'd always just kind of 
imagine kind of a dreamlike fantasy of like, you know, it'd be kind of nice to imagine living there. That'd be kind of cool. But obviously now with uh, the wealth inequality and the disparity, it's, it's like, it's a pipe dream basically just because those houses are millions and millions of dollars. So that's, that's what makes the movie even so tragic. Um, when, when Jimmy goes to get a loan, like, like as a, like a San, San Francisco native, like once he got into that bank, you just knew it was not going to go his way at all. Like, it, like you have to be a millionaire to even have a, a shot at going at a house like that. But his, his journey was also really bittersweet because those moments of him and Mott interacting with the house, the Victorian house is, is, um, just something that, that we would look forward to and, you know, kind of projecting ourselves onto those characters as well. And I really liked on the topics of masculine, masculinity and, and just the effect on that, because um, when Kofi visited uh, Jimmy and Mont at the house and they had a really great interaction in the house and it kind of gives us a glimpse at the potential, the potential of, of the, the lives that these young black men could have if they had the opportunity if they had the same successes and it's beautiful but then you know the following scene uh, we're back in the streets and it's just it hits us with the reality of of uh, that kind of that inability to 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 realize that potential which is which is very frustrating to see and I'm glad that uh, it was mentioned in the movie because I remember when I watched it in the screening there was um uh, older man that also pointed that out that he he really appreciated that um the movie hit on the fact that it, it kind of critiqued masculinity in in the black community that you know you don't always have to be hard you don't always have to be have that kind of rough life to you know there's more to it than that um, and although there's that stigma that you need it to survive uh it's going to take a it's going to take a long time to kind of get rid of that stigma but it's definitely is possible for that potential for us to to grow and succeed as a community yeah um thank you kenny man i, I think i appreciate your perspective one being from san francisco right like you, you're going to look at it from a, a totally different lens uh and, and to me i think there's a real like a, a film renaissance that's going on in the bay area like from oakland to san francisco there's a lot of powerful um, production that are coming out of that area. Um, but I do want to kind of touch on this idea of masculinity, just because, especially in our present moment, this term toxic masculinity as it pertains to Black folks or Black manhood is almost synonymous, right? And, and, it's, and it's gotten to the point that Black masculinity, right, however it's being presented, is, is viewed as a stigma, right, to the point that um society right now is more comfortable viewing a black man in a dress than a masculine black man okay so but to me like let's get to the context that creates a quote unquote toxic black male right this notion of being hard and i think it's brilliant in the movie and it's subtle but it's brilliant because he asks kofi's homeboy did i push him too hard you think I pushed them too hard, right? So to me, that lets you know that they weren't picking on Kofi just to pick on Kofi, right? They were trying to prepare Kofi for a world that don't respect you if you ain't hard, right? That will take advantage of you any chance that you get, right? That will literally kill you any chance that you get, right? I just read you uh, a text I got from my mom that she got from a, secretary, from a um, Secret Service agent. Right? So let me ask you this. And based on that context, what I just read, would you rather be hard or would you rather be sensitive and a well rounded human being? Being hard is going to get you survive. It's going to you, bring you home, right? If somebody trying to run up on you. Being sensitive is not going to bring your ass home, right? So when Kenny talks about this stigma of being masculine and having to be hard, it's not a stigma. It's a survival tactic, right? Even, even my son, I have a four-year-old son, right? Yeah, I want him to be a well-rounded and a fuel, fully evolved human being, right? But there's certain things I gotta tell him like, yo, the world don't work like that. 
as a black boy who will be perceived as a black man, man from the time you're probably 11, you don't have the luxury to not view or not to present yourself as hard, right? I can speak to myself countless times where me being able to present myself or be perceived as hard got me out of some shit, right? So this notion of hard or, or, or being tough is not hyperbole, it's not stigma, it becomes a survival tactic, right? Quite literally. And it's something that we take on and we adapt from generation to generation to generation just to ensure that there will be another generation, right? Trayvon Martin, 15. Emmett Till, I think, was 12 or 13, right? So the conversation that we have to have is different. We don't have the luxury to appear anything less than hard. And again, I'm not saying, I'm not here to advocate or to justify, but to explain it, right? We read an excerpt from Fanon that deals with the lived experience of the black man. Part of that lived experience is to present yourself as hard just so you can make it home. Um, any couple more comments and we'll call it a day. We get two more. Yeah, I'm just glad you, you mentioned that. Um, but it's just it's just like that's the you know the tragic part of it because in the in the movie, um Kofi again as a survival stuff, he 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 uh he mentioned that's the one of the reasons that he tragically passes away because someone calls him out on his bluff. And it, it's just I don't know, I'm just having a tough time just figuring out like uh I don't know what it's like, like a solution to to come out of that because it, it always seems kind of how do I like a cycle of yeah. like you need to be hard. It's the only way to survive. But at this at this certain point, there's there's always there's always someone being harmed because of it, as a result of it. And and I don't know. I just it's uh, I'm always just wondering. I wonder what steps can we all take, you know, together to. Um, just combat that, I guess, or. And, and I think for me, um, Kenny is like, it's shifting the attention and shifting the focus, right? Because right now the focus and the attention is placed on black male masculinity is toxic because you're hard, right? And, and, and violence is being assured because of this, right? But what gets effaced when you place the focus there are the societal structures that has created an environment that make you hard, right? This is this goes back to the whole P and pod analogy, right? The two P's are similar because of their proximity, but the pod is shifting their proximity, right? So we can look at the P's and say, why are you P's hard? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But what we should be looking at is how is proximity and how is this pod creating hard P's? And to me, once we start to look in and start to analyze and start to poke at that, then we can start to change the situation because it's hard to um, it's hard to fault the victim or to fault the vic or, or look at the victim to change the situation that they're being victimized in, right? You don't look at the individual who's been raped and say, "Well, how could you stop yourself from being raped? How do you stop this rape behavior?" Nah, you look at the perpetrator, right? That's the one that's responsible for stopping the behavior. So to me, the, the assessment is the same. Let's not look at the victims who are, are taking on this cloak of being hard to survive. Let's look at the circumstances that make them take on that cloak. And, and, and no, that's not going to pro provide an immediate solution, but it gets us to ask the questions that may place us closer to the solution, that place that solution in our proximity, right, within our reach. Good question. Um, one more comment. Um, I was thinking about the, there is a scene near the end of the movie where you see these two white women in the bus and that scene really stood out for me because I think because that's at the end of the movie, we kind of see these white women as like, like trying to tie into the reading, like understanding that whiteness makes you comfortable because whiteness is something that's deep on is invisible and you don't notice it. In that scene, I really noticed their whiteness because this whole movie has been centered on um, black stories and Jimmy's experience and such. And so seeing them, it just makes it so clear that they don't really belong here. Like they're, 
prancing around going from San Francisco to East LA and all this is just like a fun thing for them when they're destroying people's lives and making it harder for people to find housing and for people to live in the homes that they have an actual attachment to. So I, I just, I don't know, I always remember that scene because I also like to see like people that I've spoken to or people like I see those white women are like other instances of whiteness I've encountered and it's just like, I don't know, that scene always stands out to me. Yeah, me too, Golden. It's like the perfect bookend to the opening and, and the way that they close it. Because I'm like, oh, now y'all motherfuckers about to come down to East LA and fuck that shit up. Okay, here, here we go, right? <laughs> yeah, nah, I, I feel you. Um, so thank you guys. It was a very, very powerful conversation, great conversation. It helped me kind of get my mind off the other things that are going on in the world right now. So I, I appreciate you for that. Um, for next week, I will post a reading um, probably within the next couple of days. Um, but look on Canopy. Somebody please look on Canopy soon and let me know if you could find a documentary called 41st in Central. Um, if you can, that will be what we'll watch for next week. And I'll have a reading that will go along with that. The, tie, the, the movie, again, is called 41st in Central. So like the streets, intersection, 41st Street and Central Avenue. Um, the film is about the Black Panther Party in Los Angeles and some of the happenings that, that took place at their home um, office off of the corners of 41st and Central. A really, really powerful um, doc documentary, The Untold Story. Yes, yes. And Matthew, is that on Canopy? Uh, I'm looking for it right now. Just okay. uh, when I typed it in, it said uh, 41st and Central, The Untold Story of the LA Black Panthers. Yeah, that's okay. So let me know if you guys find that. Um, if you do, and it's on Canopy, that's what we will watch. Um, if not, I'll find something else. There's another one called Bastards of the Party. Um, it kind of intersects gang culture and the Black Panther history. Um, I, I would like to do the 41st of Central because that deals explicitly, explicitly with the Black Panthers, but we'll go either way. Um, is there any questions that you guys have for me? I'll start grading your uh, midterms and journals on Monday. I just got done with all my Pan-African Studies grades, so I'm gonna start on your guys' next. Um, so within the week, you will be receiving your grades for the midterms and the uh, journals. Um, we're coming to the end, so we're getting close. Continue to meet with your groups and um, talk about your topics of discussion. Real quick, Angel has been added to the group on um, white terrorism. So let me get you. Yes, yeah, so Angel Espinoza, you're in the group with um, Sam and Ethan. I will send a group email with the three of your guys' contact information so that way you guys can sit up and communicate and plan um, how you're going to go about the project. Okay, so it's not on Canopy? Okay, so it doesn't look like it's on there. Um, no, you typed it right, Crystal. So it's, it's probably not on there. All right, I'm gonna keep your eye out on Google Classroom. I'll spend the next two days getting the, a, another documentary. Um, there's a couple other ones that are pretty good on the, doc, on the Black Panthers, but if not, we'll do um, Bachelor of the Party, and I know that's on YouTube. So uh, just kind of be attentive to your um, Google Classroom, and you will hear from me before the end of, before Tuesday, you'll have something on, on there that we'll cover for next week. Yeah. Um, all right. I'll hang out if you guys have any questions for me. Other than that, you guys enjoy the rest of your week. All right. Have a, be safe. Um, we're getting close to the end, but we're not there yet. So keep your head on a swivel. You know what I'm saying? If you don't be alone, if you don't have to, um, just protect yourself. Be smart. You know. All right. Be well. Peace. Have a good one. Bye.